<laughs> Something like that. But anyway, we're, we're, I'm glad to be here. Not trying to outdo anybody, not trying to keep up with anybody. We just uh, do our best and, uh, and just obey the Lord and it'll all come out root and be great. All right. Uh, thank you for those of you who have turned in your test. We've got this graded. All that were turned in to me, they're graded and they're in your... Uh, they should be back there now. I think Sister Diane's got it all filed. So, uh, if you haven't received your papers back, they're they're back there. If you have not yet turned that in to me, I had a few that did not get it into me. Uh, the time restriction, the time frame that we had on that was to help you organize your work and organize your time, and not come down to the end of it and like, oh my, I got to do three of these or four of them. So, uh, if you if you ran into some problems and you're a little bit late, let me know what's going on and I'll work with you. But I, I don't know what I don't know. And uh, after a while, I'm like, you know, they just haven't done this. And you don't want to come to the end of this semester and be expecting that, to walk in a degree and, and let one thing be hindering you from being at, completed with your work. And in the fall, we have a little bit more time. We can work with you over the Christmas holidays. But in the spring, we have to get it done and get it in. So if you're having a little bit of trouble, let me know. We'll see if we can't go ahead and work on that. Uh, pretty soon, maybe by next week, we'll have some more information about graduation. It is the first Saturday in May. It's held at the Sumner building uh, in Sumner. It's, that's about six and a half miles from here, between here and Tata. And uh, we, uh, it'll be at 2 o'clock, and y'all have to be there about a little bit after 1. So that's coming up. And if you know you're scheduled to, you know, walk, some of you are in between degrees, so you know you're not going to be walking, but some of you know you're headed in that direction. We'll be getting that information to you. Those of you that need cap down, some of you will uh, We'll try to have that information for you over the next couple of weeks because we have to start getting that order in. So we'll let you know what you owe and what your, um, how much money we need. And, uh, independent studies. I mean, how many know the word independent studies? How many of you know what your independent study is this semester? Raise your hand. You know full, fully well, okay. Sometimes uh, you fail to get the reporting form into me. Uh, the state of Georgia doesn't care that we give you an independent study based on uh, a hands-on practicum. Because that's what that is. That's fine with them. We just have to have some reporting forms to show that we're not just pulling credits out of thin air and giving them to people that haven't earned them. So we have a reporting system, and that, that piece of paper that I give you um, is the reporting system. If you don't have it, if you're in ministry, if you, and this, this applies more to ministry. If you're in ministry, pulpit ministry of some type, teaching, preaching, uh, ministering in some way, then there's a specific form to fill out. If you are in non-preaching ministry, and that means... You go to the nursing homes, you go to the jails, you go visit sick folks and old folks. Uh, that's non-pulpit, but it's ministry. There's a specific form for that. If you're doing uh, uh, the Bible track and you're doing more Bible courses, then you, you know that. And you don't have a form to fill out, but there's just uh, the lessons, actually getting the lessons done. So, uh, Sister Barbara, where are you at? Sister Barbara, stand up. This is Sister Barbara Bozeman. She is helping me with the independent studies. As you complete that form, please give it to Barbara. She's going to help me keep track of that. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. I'm trying to delegate some stuff to some folks. It's, there's no point not to. And uh, we have people willing and able to do it, to do that job. I will see those forms. Have no fear, but she's going to collect them for me and help keep track of it. So that's, y'all get them in, you've got a few weeks, but just head in that direction. Because uh, uh, some of you, you've been, doing this, you've been doing the same thing, you know the drill. Some of you may have changed something, I want to know what you're doing. And uh, we want to keep track of it, keep a record of it. Alright, let's go to the Word of God. Let's go to Acts chapter 6. As we ended up Acts chapter 5, and I have to tell you, I was really, I wanted to be here. Because I had, I don't know, six pages of notes? <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. I had a lot I wanted to say. And I, uh, I trust Dr. Harris said, said it for me. Um, praise the Lord. I appreciate that. I really do. It's, there's not many people that, that you know, um, you just say, in a little bit of notice, step in and do this for, and for, for you. But I appreciate her doing that more than I can say. And, but, uh, 
great grace was on the church. There were great miracles happening, great power, and there was great fear. This balance between great grace and great fear is something that I believe the church needs. You've got uh, everybody likes to throw throw around the world the word legalism. I don't like that word, okay, and and they throw it around as a bad word. I'm going to share my heart. But let me let me tell you the opposite of legalism is lawlessness. I don't like that either. Is that okay? The man of sin that our society is running helter-skelter toward is uh, one of the definitions of his name is a lawless one. So we're not without law and order. Law and order is good. I understand religiously speaking when somebody says they're a legalist. You generally are calling somebody a Pharisee that they've just got a bunch of rules and regulations and don't care about the people. But uh, I don't want to be lawless. I don't want to be lawless. I think that that's unbalanced. I believe that the church needs an equal measure of great grace. We hear a lot about grace in the hour that we're living in. There's a, there's a lot of grace. I'm talking about ultra extreme grace. And a lot of portions of our society, they're embracing that. And they, they forget, though. They don't have a balance with the great fear of God. And we do not need to lay aside the fear of God. We need the fear of God. And the power of God, the anointing God that was flowing in the first church. It's demonstrated in these first few chapters of the book of Acts. Yeah, I, I want to, you know, I want to I wanna be there. I want a church like they had church here. I want to see the things that they saw. I want to see the people get saved like they saw get saved. I mean, it would it would hurt my feelings if it instead of, you know, three or five thousand, I wouldn't mind three or five. You know, every once in a while. You know, some people getting saved and coming into our churches. But we need this balance of great grace and great fear. I mean, no, in Acts chapter five, the great fear fell on the church because of what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. And it was a good thing that happened. And not only that, they kept growing and they kept multiplying. The fear of God does not restrict growth in the church. But there is a balance. We, I said, God, they had great grace. It was poured out in measures that they, it was almost incomprehensible. And it just keeps getting greater. Because as the grace, especially when we see what happened. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to study Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. And when there was a, when Stephen, y'all know what happens in Acts chapter 7, they stone Stephen until he's dead, right? Y'all do know that already. That's no mystery or no surprise. When that happened, uh, somehow that religious crowd and those councils, they got a taste again for Christian blood. Okay? That not just Jesus Christ himself, they got a taste again for persecution. And great persecution hit the church. And with that great persecution, the gospel began to spread. And as the gospel began to spread outside of the bonds of Judaism, they, they came face to face with the grace of God in new and living ways that they had never known. It didn't touch the bounds of circumcision. And when the Bible speaks about legalism, it's talking about you having to go through rituals and you having to go through washings and you having to go through circumcision and you having to observe holidays and times and special days. That's what legalism is. Legalism does not mean that you don't live right. Y'all do understand that, right? Amen. How many know that Christians, we ought to live right? That's, that's not an odd phrase. How many know what I'm saying when I say live right? <laughs> How many believe that a Christian ought to live right? Amen. I mean, our practice, we should not practice sinning. To him that knoweth to do good, Amen. and doeth it not to him that is sin. Yes, right. These words here is a continuous, ongoing action. He, he that knoweth to do good. And do it continually, yet not. It's a sin. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't make that in our life. We need to live right. And we need to embrace uh, sanctification. And we need to embrace uh, uprightness and clean living. It just glorifies God. And we're not trying to glorify our flesh or establish somebody's righteousness in their own merits. How many know there's no way that we can ever touch that? So great grace and great fear is in a balance in the first church here in a mighty way and they are they are moving and forward and the church is multiplying.
Okay, so let's look at Acts 6 and let's look at the, uh, let's just read this account and let's see what God is saying here. Folks get nervous when you throw out that word legalism. Lord have mercy. Got quite as a mortuary in here. I mean, but I'm telling you right now, I do I, I know one thing. Law and order is a good thing. Amen. When folks is out of control, when their flesh is out of control, and they feel like they flesh their flesh can do whatever it wants to do, whenever it wants to do it, and they're still okay. Y'all, we're in serious. That's some troubled waters right there. That is not what the New Testament teaches us. The New Testament is a, teaches us about a sold out gospel. One well, of the first things that we learn about the followers of Jesus is that they were disciplined. That's what the word disciple means. It means disciplined ones. They had come under the rod of correction, they'd come un under the governorship, they'd come under the. Christ was their uh, master, and they were being discipled, they were being taught, they were being corrected, they were being instructed, and every bit of that is a package deal. And I want it in my life. You know, step up for, we're not just believers, we're disciples. And before they were ever called Christians, they were called disciples. Yeah. And uh, I love the term Christian, but I mean, the first term that they, that hit these group of believers were they were disciples. And uh, we see this in Acts chapter 6. Verse 1, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration or ministry. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it's not reason, or it's not reasonable, it's not logical, uh, and I like those words too, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of an honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom you may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and uh, Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These seven, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now this is part one of Acts chapter 6, and we're gonna, we may get to part 2 tonight, may have to touch some of it next week. Let's talk about this tremendous thing that happened. Let me tell you this. This is the uh, first part. It's really how to handle church problems. Up to this point in time, they've had a, they, that was a little bit of trouble, what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. It was these two individuals that rose up with this great you know, uh, falseness that was in them, the pseudo-witness. Uh, and and, they, and they, the church was confronted with... Four real problems here, and I want to list them here. The first one is, the first involved the feeding of the widows. It's all tied together, but there's really four aspects of it. Uh, they were not snared up because they needed a food program. They had a food program. It was a daily, daily ministry that they did. It was every day. It was a common practice, and the food distribution was not the issue. This ministry was already in place. So, but they got a, they have a problem that's presented. It's it's wrapped around and concerning the needs of the widows and the actual serving of their tables. Secondly, this was a cultural and a racial issue. If you remember, it says the Grecians, there arose a murmuring between the Grecians and the Hebrews. Now, this was probably Hellenistic Jews. Uh, proselytes that came and they're, they're probably they're living they're connected to Jerusalem but yet some of them were born like Paul was born in uh, Tarsus which was in a region of uh, Cilicia he wasn't even born there in Jerusalem now he was a Pharisee he was not a Hellenistic Jew but there were plenty of Hellenistic Jews that filled Jerusalem uh, without them you know piping any in and, and the problem was, they said, there, there is a problem with 
the neglect of the Grecian widows in comparison to the widows that were more, more Jewish, leaned toward the old tenets of Judaism, all other Christians. But there was this separation, and a lot of times there was language barriers because not everybody that was a Hellenistic Jew or a Grecian, although they were Jewish, they maybe did not even speak uh, Aramaic. They might have, you know, they were leaning toward the culture of the Greeks, just like all other Hellenistic Jews did. So you have a, a racial and a cultural issue that's going on. And the Grecians rise up, and then you have murmuring now. You've got this uh, this other problem that's going on. Is not only do you have this neglect, and you've got this you've got this issue with the widows, and you've got this issue of racial tensions, cultural tens tensions, and this neglect that's going on. Now folks start murmuring. And how I many know that's never the solution to the problem? Yeah. Uh, now, and then because of the problem that was going on, the apostles are faced with the challenge of neglecting the Word of God and prayer. And it was an issue because Peter brought it up. If he hadn't brought it up, then we wouldn't have known it was an issue. But he said, we can't handle this situation. It's, it's an important issue. We need to address it. It's a problem. We need to get this thing settled. We need to communicate about it. But this is not something that needs to affect the Word of God, the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Now, you, how many know, y'all sitting here, some of you are pastors and ministers, that murmuring is going to affect the pulpit? Amen. And then in, in America where we live, it is, it is uh, I'll say 75% of the problem. Because if there's murmuring going on, if there's trouble going on, and the pastor gets a sermon, half, half the time you're confronted. Do I mean to preach this? Because if I do, half them folks are going to walk out the door. Is that right? It affects the Word of God. Murmuring affected Moses. <laughs> Moses did not get to go into the promised land because of what happened with murmuring. The murmuring and the complaining of those Jews incessantly, just nonstop, one time right after another, murmuring and complaining and murmuring and complaining and murmuring and complaining caused him to get so frustrated that he took that rod and smote that rock when God said, speak to it and let me be glorified. But his anger and his frustration, it wasn't, <laughs> that's what kept him out. You know, that strife, it was that the waters of strife and that strife entered into his spirit. And a lot of times when murmuring's going on and you got this, he said, she said, and yeah, 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 nah, 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 and stuff. You talk about frustrating. That's frustrating for the ministry. And it, and it presented a great problem that could have been extremely frustrating for the, for the apostles to handle. He said, uh, but, but we're not going to neglect the Word of God. That's not the answer. So there was an answer. There was an answer. Uh, there was a problems that needed to be solved. But all problems have a solution. Sometimes it involves somebody humbling down. Now look, the apostles didn't get all huffy and try to deny that the Grecian widows were being neglected because apparently there was proof to show that there was a difference being made. And I'm not standing up here telling you that there aren't racial tensions in our nation, in our culture, in our churches. I mean, it's all over this world. They're there. But I'm going to tell you what, there's a solution to every problem. Uh, they came together and they began talking about the problems. They began addressing the problems and looking at the problems with an honest heart, wanting to find real solutions. Do y'all believe that God has the solutions to our problems? Oh, yeah. Do you believe that there, the problems in the church, they do not have to destroy the church. They don't have to destroy the ministry of the Word. They don't have to leave people neglected. Now this word neglected, the reason we know that this was a viable charge is because it means to be overlooked or disregarded or dismissed as if you're not important. Well, the Grecian widows were just as important as any other widows, and they needed to be ministered to. And so there needed to be a balance, and there needed to be a fairness, and God was going to give them the answer. I'm so glad for the answers that God can give us. When we really want to know an answer, a solution, God's got it for us. God's got it for us. So the twelve called the multitude together in verse 2 and said it's not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. We can't neglect the Word to try to solve this problem. Y'all, we, we really do need to pay attention to that. We, this, Peter never said this isn't a relevant problem to the church. Peter never dismissed the problem. 
don't misunderstand me because he did not do that. But he did offer another solution that would not hinder the ministry of the Word. And thank God that there needs to be ministries within our church that they can handle some of these things. We need men and women of God that they can concentrate on the Word, concentrate on, on teaching, concentrate on preaching, concentrate on prayer, because how many know it's really needed? There's, and, and Peter said it's not reason that we leave the Word of God and leave prayer to try to solve this problem or, or be the solution ourselves. And most of the time, when people bring a problem to the pastor, they want the pastor to physically, literally, themselves handle the problem. Isn't that right? Amen. <laughs> I ought to be getting more amens. There's more pastors out there. Uh, Y'all's congregation ain't here tonight. Y'all can saw holler amen. <laughs> Look, they, they, they had a job to do. And their job was not that ministry. No one ever said that this ministry was not a viable ministry and that it didn't need attention. It needed attention. It was causing some great problems in that early church, that first church. It needed to be addressed. The problems in our churches need to be addressed. Church, they're not going to go away if we ignore them. And once folks start murmuring, once folks start talking, you, you better come up with a solution. And But we need to come up with a biblical solution. And this was the biblical solution. And so they called and they said, uh, the pastor cannot and should not do it all. If that's not reasonable or logical. And neglecting the Word of God is never the answer. To put out fires continually all the time. To spend all your energy on, on putting out fires and listening to murmuring and complaining and griping and groaning. Please, really? Y'all think that pleases the Lord? I know it doesn't. I know it doesn't. And we need, if we want to get back... And we want to have more of the first church in us. We need to do things the way that they did things. Y'all leaving folks and murmuring and groaning and complaining is never the answer. And we can lovingly tell people this. Before we get mad, before we get hot under the collar like Moses did and take our rod and smite the rock, you know, and, and, and get in the same spirit that they're in, that, that, I'm going to tell you, that'll take you down and keep you out of the promised land. It kept Moses out of the promised land. Keep you out of your inheritance. Keep you from walking in... The place where God wants you to walk. I didn't necessarily say keep you out of heaven, but I, I wouldn't want to push that envelope either. But how many know that people have a mentality? Half the people sitting in y'all's churches, maybe even some of you in this place tonight, have a mentality of I'm saved and that's enough. I'm okay. I'm gonna, I know, but I'm gonna tell you something. There's a whole life to be led. A walking in the Spirit and knowing God. Down here right now. I mean, I'm looking I'm looking for heaven. And I'm, I'm beginning to pray just like the rest of us. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Well, I'm looking, my eyes is on the eastern sky. To, but, but in the meantime, I want to walk in every promise that is mine to walk in right now on this earth. I want to be a believer. I want to, my inheritance. And that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The earnest of, the earnest of our inheritance. And I want it. I want my 10%. Right now. <laughs> you think about that. 10% of everything heaven is. Uh, yeah, that's good. 10% of everything that heaven has. We can, we, we, at least that much. You know, and sometimes a good earnest money is more than 10%, right? Now, what it, sometimes, you know, you've got to put up 20 or 25%. So I'm going real low on that percentage there. So heaven's got some things for us. There's, there's a life in the Spirit. A life that, that is not bound to just the carnal realm of thinking and living and walking. And uh, we want it. And murmuring will hinder that. Murmuring will stop it. If they hadn't stopped this murmuring, stopped this complaining, everything else would have come to a grinding halt. Now look, Ananias, as, as Dr. Harris said last week, you know, right in the middle of all these miracles and the wonders and the signs and this folks getting saved and, and believers being added to the church every day. It was uh, and them growing as they were growing. Right in the middle of that, we find Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, this, what, a, what a terrible thing to have to come in contact with. But it still did not stop the flow and the moving of the Spirit of God working in the apostles and working in the believers and uh, reaching out to, to those that were lost. But this murmuring had the potential to bring it all to a grinding halt. So God, God led them to, to do something about it. Leadership responsibilities 
um, is never to set aside the work uh, of the Word of God. To do and, and, and for pastors to do the work that other people can do. Uh, the Lord is, uh, you know, I know preachers wear all kinds of hats. I've probably got 15 on right now. Because <laughs> y'all know it's true, but the truth of the matter is the more stuff that we try to do, and it, if it takes away from the Word of God, takes away from prayer, we do need to try to start delegating things. God's been, you know, it's taken a long time. i got a hard head. But I'm, I'm, you know, and I, I don't, I'm a control freak. I'm a, I'm a quiet control freak, but uh, I am a control freak. And, and God's been working on me with that, turning loose of stuff and letting other people do it, turning loose of it and saying, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, Sister uh, Tracy uh, Chester's really helping me the last uh, couple, few semesters, three or four semesters now. She's taken a great load off of me, and those that's known me a long time know that it's a miracle that I don't even think about it. I don't even worry about it. And it's, it's, that's a, Judy knows. <laughs> some, of, some of you know me personally know that that's a great thing. And there's others. Sister Tina is helping uh, take a great load out, off of me, working with, helping me begin to work with the distance learners. And now uh, even Sister Barbara going to work with the independent study. And I'm trying, y'all. <laughs> I'm trying because there's one thing I know. The more busy stuff that I do, uh, it keeps me from doing what I know I have to do. And uh, when you're wore out in your mind and your body and your spirit, you cannot do what God would have you do to the best of your abilities. Peter and John and them, they could dish the soup out. They really could have, but it would have been time taken away from where God needed them to be. So if, if you've got something, there, there's, there's enough people. And we are not diminishing the ministry that, that needed to be done. Not on any level. So, <laughs> he says to them, this is the solution. Verse 3, this is the solution. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among yourselves seven men full of an honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom ye may appoint over this business. Now, the biblical standard of leadership qualifications to run a soup kitchen. Okay. Now, I don't know what else to call it. This, and I'm not diminishing it because if I was needing food, I'm telling you, I'd be singing the praises of the soup kitchen. There've been plenty of times in my life that I went to a food pantry somewhere and got me some groceries. How many raise your hand and say amen? amen? So thank God for it. I'm not diminishing it. I want to fill anybody's pantry that needs filling. This is not something that we're, that we're putting down on any way. But listen at the qualifications that they wanted the people over this. They didn't just want somebody that's half in, half out, unfaithful, unsteady, un ungrounded, unrooted in the Word. They wanted seven men that was of an honest report. Okay, that's one qualification. Honest witness. This word report is the same word that was used. <laughs> Lord of mercy. When the, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when it says, When the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power to become my witnesses. Mm -hmm. You're going to receive power to become a true witness. The very opposite of where Ananias and Sapphira were, they were liars. Mm -hmm. They were pseudo, they were false, they were not true witnesses. Their witness and their testimony was not a true witness. So uh, we know that they, uh, that's where they were. That's what they had. But Stephen was a man that was full of, 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 of and I'm telling you, he was full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. And these six that were with him. Now, this is something interesting to note. These seven men, all their names are Grecian Greek names. They're not Hebrew names here. They're Greek names. And they're, they're given in, in, in the Greek terms. So undoubtedly, them apostles, Peter, them full, full of wisdom themselves, said, okay, to the ones who were murmuring, to the ones who brought the complaint and said, look, our widows are being overlooked, they're being neglected, they're being dismissed. And so he told them, he said, you look among yourselves and you pick out seven men from among you, not this group over here that you think is neglecting you, but your own selves. We're going to put them over this business. We're going to appoint them to be the administrators of this business. And church, this was no small thing. This wasn't just the appointments of, of seven deacons in one local assembly or local church. This, these men were over the whole business. So they were, they were administrators. They were leaders. And the qualifications that, that these men of God put on them is their spiritual character. There, there was no blemish in them. So they've got to be true witness. A true witness. And as we read about the life of Stephen, he was 
uh, the first truest witness of Jesus Christ that was in the New Testament. Because this word witness is the word maturion. And it's the word, the Greek word that we get, we get the word martyr from it. Uh, the, the word martyri, martyros is a Greek word stemmed from this, from a true witness. You've got a true report. You've got an honest report. You've got a faithful report to the point that I will die for what I'm telling you. I will seal this testimony in my own blood. When they stood on the witness stand and said, Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, even to the point that you, you would lay your down your life for it? They said yes. Why was it so important that these men be filled up with a good report? One of, listen. Jesus could have told His disciples that, that they would be anything. You know how motivated motivational speakers are. You know, that can tell us, you know, you're, you are going to be successful. You are going to be dynamic. You are going to be uh, overcomers. They could have used any word that they chose. The Spirit of God through Jesus Christ Himself has said, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you're going to receive power to become my witnesses. And y'all don't get any better than that to be a true and faithful witness. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, you know, be all gifted. We can be all talented. But if we ruin our testimony, if our testimony is no good, if people don't trust our word, if they don't believe the things that come out of our mouth, if they think that we tell half lies or half truths, however you want to look at it, then our witness is no longer true. Our witness becomes pseudo and it's false. But Stephen and these men, they had, they had a true and an honest witness. Thank God. I'm telling you, that is no small character. It's somebody not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. And, and so many times, and I'm going to say something. Y'all get mad if you want to or not. Pray for me. I'm not trying to be controversial in any way. I'm, I'm, I, I try with everything that's in me to avoid controversy. But I think it is a shame and a disgrace before the living God to put men in these offices when... Uh, just because they're a man. When I read these qualifications, it does it, you know. You gotta be a living, breathing man. Don't say you're carnal minded, dead spiritually, never really been saved. You're sitting on a church pew, but we're gonna make you a deacon because you're a man. It's a shame that our churches have had so few men. They have had so few men that we have had to settle for the, 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 the atheist, the agnostic, the unbelieving, and the carnal to be deacons in our church. Look, these, these men were honest men, true faithful witnesses, willing and able to lay down their life for the testimony of Jesus Christ, full of the Spirit of God and full of wisdom. Whatever happened to these qualifications? And he told them, Peter and them didn't say, drag your men up here and we're going to decide. He said, you do it. You have enough discernment in your congregation. You pick out the seven men. You tell me from among you what men among you is filled with the Spirit of God, filled with wisdom, and full of a good report. they got a true testimony. I tell you, I hope with everything that's inside of me that when you go outside of these walls, and you tell somebody, I'm a student, I'm a graduate, I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, I have a doctorate degree, I have an associate degree, whatever degree level you're at with, uh, Southwest Georgia Theological Seminary, don't you go out there and embarrass me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Don't, you know, don't drag us down with you. Tell if you're going to be living in the gutter, don't take us with you. Amen. You know, give me your degree back and I'll keep it and say, keep it. Get yourself straightened out. But I, that's the way I feel about it. You know, because it's a lot of hard work. And y'all, whatever, that's the way I feel about it. You know, don't go out there and show yourself. And act like you don't even know who Jesus is. And you don't stand up and tell somebody you got a bachelor's degree. And they're going to be laughing. They're going to be cracking up. You know, you know, you know, mocking you, making fun of you, and mocking the school and mocking the Lord. And, and that's what's happened with the testimony of the church. But I believe as it was then, it is now. The Lord needs true witnesses. True and faithful witnesses. Well, you know, six things God hates. He hates a, you know, the lying tongue. <laughs> you know, John said that he sent me to bear witness of the, of the truth. 
He said, John said at first, I, I am not that light, but he sent me to bear witness of that light. Mm -hmm. We're not the light, but we've been sent to bear witness of the light. Good light. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and we ought to witness and, and testify well. And we don't need to perjure ourselves on the witness stand of our life. And one thing, and John addressed this in his epistle. First John is loaded up. He says, you should not say one thing and do something else. He said, if you're doing that, then you are a liar. And that word is pseudo. Okay? Just we're going back to that again. Because we're talking about something that is absolutely directly opposed to what is false. We're talking about something true. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Amen. You sing it. You raise your hands and the tears fall down and spring down your face. But is He Lord of your life? Yeah. Do not testify of it. Do not witness it. Do not raise your hand and put your hand on a Bible as it was and say, I am a Christian if you're really not a Christian. Amen. I just, I, that, that, yeah. So true. Good character. Seven men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't just their job alone to do all this. But they were over the work. They were appointed to this work. And it took many others working and laboring, I'm sure, to meet this need. It was a shared ministry. But this kind of integrity needs to be in every corner of our churches. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the most qualified to do the work. Not just a, a breathing body. Don't put somebody over a work. So they walk in the door and five minutes after they get there, they want to appoint them as a Sunday school teacher. You don't know you don't know their life. You don't know their background. You, and look, the Lord forgives. How many know the Lord forgives? And He washes us clean, but you don't need to put a sex offender in your Sunday school class. You, you need to find out these things and know them that labor among you. Is that all right if I'm real That's about right. that? I mean, you know, if they, if they do these background checks and try to to look at people's lives in the public school system and, and on jobs and, and, you know, in the daycare system, then how much more in our churches that we ought to know them that labor moment. You ought to know if somebody's full of wisdom. You ought to know if they're silly and contrary or whether they know the Word of God. And we're not trying to keep people out, but we are trying to safeguard the integrity of the church. Amen. And this was an important ministry uh, because it was needed to be done. But it wasn't... Y'all have to know that feeding these widows was not doing what the apostles were doing. It was different. It was a separate ministry. And, and, but this ministry, this neglect, had the potential to tear down what the apostles were doing. And so they, they'd set a precedent for us today that there'd be men and women, and I'll say this too, in the book of Romans, we read about Phoebe, who Paul sent the letter, mm -hmm. the epistle to the Romans, through Phoebe. How many know? She was a servant of the church of Centuria. This word servant is the same Greek word that's translated deacon. That's right. She was a deaconess. I believe in deaconesses. I believe that, that, that women can be full of the Holy Ghost. And I believe they can be full of wisdom. And I, can, I believe that they have a good report. And I believe the church needs to make good use of some good women deacons. Yeah. Um, and, and help work the church work Amen. and there's different ministries for women and men I know that there's different callings for men every man just because they're a man and, and I'll say this 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 is things that's in my heart and my spirit just eight verses here but y'all it's loaded up I've seen in, in a lot of our churches in the south this is what happens I've got our little country churches and we got 50 75 people in them does that sound about right mm -hmm. maybe a hundred you got a really good church. You got about a hundred people in there. And look, the mega churches—they just laugh at the hundred people church. But most of us, if you have a congregation of a hundred people, you are thanking God, yeah. praising God that you don't have 150 because then you just got 50 more problems. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that, that's how you feel some days. We uh, we we have a tendency to uh, you know dismiss. Dismiss the smaller churches. And we all want to be a part of something really large and exciting and uplifting and upbeat and the most upbeat. And we kind of crave that as human beings. It's kind of natural. So it's kind of hard sometimes to, uh, to, to take down and be a part of a small church, be a part of a small ministry, and small leadership. And a lot of times I think you see this happen with men and women. Okay, we'll take the thing with men and women. But, and, and, and I'm not going to say especially men as, as being a slur against men. But so somebody, they get, they get saved, they get, 
They're on fire for God. They start walking with God. And they're just, you know, bursting with wanting. They want to do something for the Lord. And the way that a lot of times that preachers are and other deacons are, they got their chest puffed out, their restrictions, and they either squash what's in that new believer or they push them out there before they're ever ready. And I'm saying, I think that instead of this new convert jumping up with their chest puffed out, you know, I do this better than you because they all want to claim, you know, I'm David and they're Saul and Saul's killed his thousands, but watch me kill my ten thousand when they ain't even been through one trial yet, one battle yet, but that's, that's another issue. But, but they leave the church that they were birthed in. They leave the church and go start their own church. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of become, being in a church and being a, a spirit-filled uh, person of wisdom, spirit-filled person of a good, honest report, strengthening their church, they feel that with their egos, they got to go start their own church. Mm -hmm. And this, this problem is not just in the new rising up, but it's also in the old that's like Saul that wants to ask somebody and throw javelins at them. We need to get this straight that we can raise up strong, spirit-filled men and women within our churches that we stand together and work together for the ministry of the body of Christ. Instead, everybody's got their own little fire over here. you got one little group here, one little group here, one little group here, one little group here, one little here, one little here. And most of them are divided and separated in it. Murmuring is at the root of most of it. Amen. And here we see the Spirit of God through the apostles squashing down the murmuring and coming up with a divine solution. Amen. Hallelujah. God help us. And it was men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. Okay, he said, we're going to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the Word of God. The, the first calling of spiritual leaders in our church is prayer and the Word of God. Um, the most small churches... Pastors are worked to death with a lot of busy work. Stuff that other people can do and should do. Men and women of God need time to, to get along with God. They need time to, to get in the Word of God. They need time to be still and to hear the voice of God. If you're a leader, if you're a pastor, if you're an associate pastor, if you help in the leadership ministry in the Word in your church at all, you have to make time in your life for these things. Right. You are cheating your people, you're robbing your people, and you are neglecting what needs to be done. And uh, let somebody else go out on Tuesday night visitation. Mm -hmm. Tell your people. I want to, and, and do it. Don't, don't tell somebody else to go visit and you sit in front of the TV clicking the remote. Yes. You know, but actually get in the Word and get in prayer. Don't you think our churches would be strengthened greatly yes. if deacons would do what they're actually were ordained by God to do? Amen. I do. I really do. Men and women. They, they, so they brought them before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. This is the biblical act of ordaining ministry within the church. But all of these were Greek names and this solved, this solved the ministry that needed to be done. It solved the neglect. It solved the racial tensions. And it caused that the Word of God in prayer within the ministry of the apostles was not neglected. So this, this solution solved all of those problems. I, I believe that God can start giving us some answers if we'll listen. Yeah. Choosing these, these seven brought unity back to the body. Eliminating all these issues. And look what verse 7 says. What does it say? That's right, greatly. Listen to this. The Word of God increased. There were fewer distractions and less murmuring. What happens when there's fewer distractions and less murmurings? The Word of God is going to increase. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't this what we need to happen? Within, if it's ministry and it said the Word of God increased, because the Word of God increased, the disciples multiplied. And the religious, which was a great company of the priests, were obedient to the faith. You think about this. Somehow, in solving this problem and answering this dilemma, it opened up for an increase in the Word. And the increase in the Word reached a people group that up to this point in time had been unreached. Mm -hmm. The priest. They were religious. They were A lot of the priests of those days was tied up in Sadduceeism. Not just Phariseeism, but it reached... <coughs> The Word of God increasing in our churches and the multiplication of the Word and prayer going forth in our churches is going to reach people. It's going to cause, it's going to cause our congregations to be increased. It's going to cause our members to grow. How I many know what Romans 10 and 17 says? 
Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. There's no other way to cut the work of growth is going to come. It's a direct result of what's happening in the Word. It's a direct, because uh, the sower went forth to sow. And some fell by the wayside, some fell on thorns, some fell on stony ground. It was the three different things that says that it was either um, devoured, scorched, or choked. <laughs> Those things that happen to the seed that falls by the wayside among thorns and on stony ground. Either devoured, scorched, or choked. And in our, in our churches, this murmuring, this complaining, is part of what's causing the word to be choked or the word to be devoured by the fowls of the air, the word of God to be scorched. Uh, what's happening with the word in your church? Look, the seed, the good seed is the word of God. There is nothing wrong with the seed. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with the seed. It's the ground that needed conditioning. Y'all know it's the truth. And we... But when it fell on good ground, when the seed, the Word of God, fell on good ground, it brought forth fruit. Thirty-fold, sixty-fold, a hundred-fold. John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you abide in me and you don't bring forth fruit, I'm going to take you away. But if you abide in me and you're bringing forth fruit, I'm going to work on you and you're going to bring forth more fruit. Because you're clean through the Word which I've spoken unto you. And if my word abides in you and, and you abide in my word, you can ask what you will and it shall be done. Mm -hmm. And herein is my Father glorified that you bring forth much fruit uh -huh. and that your fruit will remain. Another direct connection to the word of God. If growth is going to happen in your church, divine growth, it's going to happen because there is going to be an increase in the ministry of the word of God. Mm -hmm. and you have number growth, but spiritual growth is coming through the word of God. Yes, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm totally convinced, and I have lots of scriptures to back it up. Mm -hmm. Stephen was full of faith and power, mm -hmm. and did great wonders and miracles among the people. Well, of all I am as a deacon, I can't really fulfill my ministry. Mm -hmm. Whose ministry? Yeah. It's the Lord's yeah. ministry. Right. Stephen wasn't hindered in any way. He did what the church needed him to do. He walked in what they needed him to do, and he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Mm -hmm. get, does it get any better than that? That's right. I mean, if you're wanting to work in ministry, hands-on ministry, I can just imagine it. Daily, he's feeding people. But while he's feeding people and overseeing the work, I don't know, I, you know, who knows if he ever took a shopping cart, so to speak, and went down to the market and got some of the food to pass out to people. But while he was at it, it didn't stop his faith. It didn't hinder what was in him in any measure. And he preached one of the mightiest sermons of all of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. One of the longest. Right. I do. And he was not an apostle. He was not an apostle. And these miracles and his faith was not limited to just the apostles. It spilled over into these men that were full of the Holy Ghost and full of the wisdom and full of an honest and a good report. Amen. And he did great things among the people. And he's the very first martyr of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? Somebody tell me what time it is. Is it 8? Right at 8? All right, we've got a whole other section, but since this goes along with chapter 7, we'll, we'll put it all together there for next week. But we, uh, look, you got some accusations. They couldn't stand it. Whatever God was doing in Stephen, there was some in the synagogue of the Libertines, they couldn't handle it. They, they, they didn't know how to resist him. They didn't know how to stop him. Now trust me, they wanted to resist him. Because we'll read about it in chapter 7. One of the great ac accusations that Stephen throwed back to them. An indictment was you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So we see that. So alright, we, we, uh, and I'll get, I'll get with this. But let me, let me throw this tidbit at you as y'all go. There were five great accusations that these accusers brought before Stephen. Said that he had blasphemed against God, against Moses, against the law, against the temple, and against the customs of the people. Five indictments that they brought against Stephen. And we're going to watch in his sermon in chapter 7 how he turns every one of them around. Turns the tables on them, uh, his accusers, and stands free and clean before God, and heaven opens up and brings as it was heaven to its feet. 
<laughs> so, so we're glad about Stephen and, and the Lord bless y'all. We're gonna we're gonna be dismissed this class into our other classes and uh, let's just uh, let's bow our heads. Uh, Brother Jim, uh, it's, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight? Amen. Holy Father, we're here for you tonight, Lord. We're here to multiply that knowledge that you laid upon this school so that we might grow in your word, that we might understand your word, and that we might carry out your word, Father. Yes. Pray that you, you open our eyes and our ears, condition our mind to receive the message you bring tonight so that we can, we can discern, that we can make a meaning in some other person's life, yes. that we can bring somebody else to you. Father, we ask that you show us a path Show us a means and a way to yes. use this uh, lesson and use the other lessons we learned tonight. Father, we thank you so much for this school. We pray that you uh, go with our instructors, uh, keep them safe, keep their minds open to the message you have for them so that we might continue to learn and that we might continue to grow. Father, all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 On page 10 of your notebook in the uh, Unit 2, it's in the outline, uh, in Unit 2 on page 10, there is a list of the qualifications for deacons that's listed in other places in Timothy and uh, in other places in the New Testament and also then on page uh, 25 of Unit 2 is uh, a little bit more information there. Uh, coincides with Acts chapter 6 and the, and the qualifications that the New Testament gives us the deacons. So uh, that's that's just good information. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Amen.